And now I'm going to hand things over to Cara Baldessera, who is one of our presenters today, but also the Fire Protection TRG coordinator. Carl? Thank you, Laurel. Uh, I believe most of you know that Nick and I worked together at Rolf Jensen and Associates before coming to Wis Jenny, and we are both degreed fire protection engineers. I also believe you know that Nick works out of the Chicago office, and I work most of the time from the Northbrook office and visit the Chicago office periodically. Nick and I have been looking forward to the, uh, presenting this webinar to our colleagues. We each have received a number of questions about this topic from various project managers throughout the company. We thought it would be good to present a webinar on this topic to assist in an understanding of what the fire resistance ratings are intending to achieve, where they come from, and how to apply them to your projects. We're not going to get into a lot of detail in this brief webinar, but we believe this information will nevertheless be quite useful. Learning objectives for the program today are to understand the meaning of hourly ratings, to understand the concept of fire resistance rated construction, to understand the typical test, uh, test methods used for roofs, floors, columns, rated walls, and the pass-fail criteria for those tests. Also to learn the various sources of information so that you can evaluate the ratings of existing construction assemblies and to select appropriately rated assemblies for repairs and restoration projects. So the outline of the presentation today is we'll have an introduction. We will get into the details of the, excuse me, ASTM E119 fire test. We'll talk a little bit about how the standard uh, fire test differs from real fires pass-fail criteria for the tests. Uh, we'll talk about fire resistance ratings, how to determine a re the requirements for a project, how to select appropriate designs for a project, and then what if, what if alternative solutions are necessary. And then uh, we'll get into a few case studies we have for the day as well. So, um, Brief examples of some fire tests that you might have encountered in your project work. Many of these tests rely upon the same fire exposure we'll be reviewing in the E119 fire test. This test, uh, UL10B, covers fire door assemblies for use in wall openings to resist the passage of fire. It's intended to evaluate the ability of the door assembly to remain in a wall during the test exposure. This test, like others, includes important details about the test sample, the temperature exposure, and fast uh, uh, pass-fail criteria. And also, like with most other fire tests, this UL standard 10B has companion standards written by NFPA or ASTM with different standard designations. So you may see design documents or building codes using UL10B or other test standard designations, so it's something we wanted you to be aware of. This next, uh, next example, UL2079, is applicable to joint systems that are intended for use in linear openings between adjacent fire resistive structures. For example, uh, the illustration shows the joint where a fire rated wall meets a fire rated floor slab. And the joint materials we are most familiar with include the various fire caulks. ASTM E2307 applies to perimeter fire containment systems where a rated floor adjoins a curtain wall with no hourly rating and addresses the materials intended to fill the gaps between the floor and the curtain wall, what I call this stuff, uh, to prevent the vertical spread of fire in the building. It's sometimes what we call slab edge protection, and it's meant to prevent the, uh, the spread of fire from floor to floor at the curtain wall. And I know this is a familiar topic to many project managers within uh, WJE. The next UL790 uh, measures the uh, relative ability of a mock-up roof covering to withstand 
simulated fire sources. And what's important here is that this applies to the roof covering. And also, it, it is intended to apply to fires originating from outside of the building on which the covering is installed. This test applies to roof coverings for both combustible and non-combustible roof decks. And you may know the resultant ratings uh, as Class A, Class B, and Class C roof coverings. Now, this is an area where we receive a large number of project inquiries. It's important to know that the rating of the roof covering is entirely different from the structural fire resistance rating of the roof assembly intended to withstand a fire from within the building. Another example of a fire test you might be familiar with is uh, UL 1479, which covers through penetrations of various materials and construction that are intended for use uh, for openings in walls, floors, floor ceiling assemblies. Again, this typically involves products known as fire caulks, as noted by the arrow in this photo. Now, we could go further with examples, but I believe you understand the point. There are literally dozens and dozens of fire tests which apply to building construction. It's important that the appropriate test be used for the application whether you're reviewing or applying fire tests. In my case, I have often encountered data supplied by vendors which was not relevant to the use of the product. Now we're going to focus on the very important fire test applicable to fire resistant rating of building structural elements, what I call the father of the fire test regime, often referred to as the E119 fire test. This is the primary topic of today's presentation. The ASTM E119 test uh, is the place where the standard time temperature curve resides. It's the fire test that applies to assemblies of structural materials for buildings, including bearing walls, other rated walls, columns, girders, beams, and assemblies for floors and roofs. It's the source of many questions from various WJE project managers, and it's what's prompted the idea for this webinar. What you see in the illustration there is the fire test um, furnace at Underwriters Laboratories, and the assembly is lifted by crane above the, above the flames in the uh, furnace. So why are ratings needed? Fire resistant ratings are specified in building codes primarily as a matter of life safety and secondarily as a matter of property protection. The goal is to protect the structure from collapse or substantial damage. This is especially important for buildings where the failure of the structure due to fire would be intolerable, such as a hospital where the fire safety strategy is to protect the patients in place because they cannot be readily moved. This is also true for high-rise buildings, which cannot be evacuated in a reasonable time, therefore requiring the structure to provide, in part, for the defense of the building occupants. Building codes have largely determined when fire resistance rated structures are needed, and protecting a, ne a neighboring building which may be in close proximity to a property line, is another example. In some cases where the owner has a large aversion to property loss, such as a telecommunication facility, structural fire resistance can play an important role in maintaining business continuity. So fire resistance rating can be defined as the time that a mock-up assembly withstands the fire exposure during the furnace test. I'll talk more about what it means to withstand the fire in a few minutes. What's especially relevant here are the words that the tested assembly is a mock-up and that the fire exposure is from a furnace test. This is not necessarily representative of the actual construction or a real fire. <clears throat> 
as you can see from the chart, fire testing of building components in a furnace goes back almost 100 years. Requirements for fire resistance testing of building components date back to the 1927 edition of the Uniform Building Code. Now this method of fire testing has been criticized in recent years and was the subject of increased scrutiny following the collapse of the World Trade Center in 2001. Indeed, there are some shortcomings with this test. The construction of fire resistant rated buildings is largely dependent upon the results derived from a 17 foot by 17 foot furnace, which cannot test components larger in size. It does not test connections and it may not be related to the actual fire load of the building. At best, the test uh, can be considered a relative index system to compare designs. It does not predict actual performance or hourly ratings are not what the sur real survival of the components will be under all conditions when measured against the clock. It tests the survival of components to this fire exposure only. This next slide is an illustration of the ASTM E119 standard time temperature curve. This includes the data points that the furnace must achieve during the fire exposure. And the data points are identified every five minutes for a temperature. For example, the furnace temperature is to be 1,000 degrees at five minutes, 1,300 degrees at 10 minutes, and 1,550 degrees at 30 minutes, 1,700 at one hour, 1,850 at two hours, 2,000 at four hours, and 2,300 degrees at eight hours or more. And there are very specific tolerances identified in the standard about the furnace performance and other protocols. This illustration shows the relationship between the interior temperature of a building and the effect on exposed steel. Why this is important is the title of the slide. The curve labeled real fire shows the typical fire growth versus time with increasing temperature. And I'll talk more about this real fire versus the standard fire in, in a few minutes. But as you can see from this slide, as the temperature increases from an uncontrolled fire growing in the building, it will eventually increase the temperature of the structure. And as many of you know, as the temperature of the steel increases, it loses strength and will not carry the loads leading to structural damage and possible collapse. This is why structural components need to be insulated from the heat of an uncontrolled fire within a building. Now more specifically, comparing the standard fire to a real fire. Oops. This graph shows data from a number of actual uncontrolled fires in buildings which have been studied, and which again show the growth of the fire in relationship of time versus temperature. The red line is the fire exposure required by the ASTM E119 test. So it's fairly representative of actual, but not all fires. It's clear that real fires in the growth phase reach a maximum heat release and temperature fairly quickly then decay as the fuel is consumed. The growth phase of a fire is based upon a number of variables, such as the properties of the fuel, the geometry of the fuel, and ventilation of the compartment. Whereas real fires decay as the fuel is consumed, as shown in the graph, the standard time temperature curve keeps going as if the fuel is unlimited. So there is some conservatism in that regard. This is an illustration which compares the E119 curve with the contemplated exposure from a hydrocarbon fire, which is known as E1529, which is a more uh, severe and quicker growing fire. It also compares the E119 curve with the curve from the international standard, 
ISO 83, uh, 834, which is pretty close, and another curve used for external fires. So depending upon the application of our work, it may be more appropriate to use one of these other curves. It's also of some interest to note that actual fire exposures and the required fire resistance has some relevance in real life to what we call fuel load expected for a space. For example, we would expect that the fuel load given in pounds per square foot for an office building would be less than the fuel load for a furniture warehouse. Therefore, if we are interested in protecting the structure, the fire resistance rating should be greater for the warehouse than for the office building. This gets into the interesting topic of performance-based design versus the prescriptive requirements of a building code. And while interesting, it's beyond the scope of this webinar. The method of fire testing today essentially decomposes building uh, into individual structural elements columns, beams, floors, and roof. Each element is tested independently. And as I mentioned earlier, the connections, a vital element of successful performance, are not tested. This is an example for columns. It's clear that some type of insulating protection must be provided to protect the structural system from the high temperatures of a fire exposure. Now looking at these columns, we see three major methods of protecting the column against structural failure due to fire. On the left, we see an illustration of an I-beam, which has been enclosed by a material such as gypsum board to insulate the exposed steel from the heat of a fire exposing the column. In the center, we see the same eye section fully encapsulated by a material such as concrete to insulate the steel column. And on the right, we see the column with a coating such as a spray applied fire resistant material to insulate the column from the effects of a fire. In all cases, the thickness of the insulating material is dependent upon the desired hourly rating, the mass and shape of the steel member, and the physical properties of the insulating material. This graph shows a concept which has been called the fire severity area concept. It's a concept that until now has been broadly accepted to demonstrate the comparison of a short intense fire to a longer duration, lower intensity fire as being equivalent in the amount of energy impacting the construction materials and therefore equivalent in fire severity. This has recently been criticized as not being valid and more, I expect to get more information on this in the next few years, but I believe it's still uh, something we can think of as a concept of, a, of equivalent fire severity uh, based on fire exposure if these two areas are comparable. As I mentioned, the industry recognizes there are shortcomings with the current testing we perform to determine acceptable designs. As mentioned, the current system has been in place for almost 100 years, and the cost and disruption of discarding the thousands of test results, retesting thousands of assemblies, and replacing them with assemblies tested under another method would be staggering. The point is the overall system is not perfectly scientific, but recognizing it for what it is, a system of relative performance or an index system, it served the industry pretty well. We'll now review some of the typical pass-fail criteria for these major structural elements. For columns, the passing criteria is simply to carry the load for the desired time period while exposing it to the ASTM E119 fire curve in the furnace. Alternatively, if it can be demonstrated that the column steel temperatures do not uh, exceed prescribed limits, then the column design can also be approved. Now, it should be noted that the test standard provides detailed information about the number, location, and types of thermocouples used 
to measure the temperature of the steel within the column, as well as a very prescribed furnace temperature during the exposure period. Now, this photo is of a column in the furnace after a test. And the wires that you see in the photo lead to thermocouples, which measure the temperature of the steel in the column. Pass-fail criteria, another example, a uh, uh, fire-rated bearing wall. For load-bearing walls, the assembly must carry the load without allowing the passage of flame or hot gases to the non-furnace side, and, and also prevent the projection of water from a hose stream test, uh, which is uh, uh, something else to talk about in another day. Uh, but also the temperature is measured at several specified locations on the non-fire side of the wall sample. The assembly must prevent transmission of heat on the unexposed side not more than 250 degrees above ambient on the average. The purpose of limiting the temperature transmission through the sample is intended to prevent ignition of combustibles on the other side of the wall. Pass-fail criteria for floor and roof assemblies. Uh, the, the, this is a more complex uh, that can be conveyed in this slide, but to be pretty simple about it, like other criteria, it, is, it affects whether or not the assembly is designed to be a restrained or unrestrained uh, design, as well as the spacing of steel that all comes into the criteria. But some of these criteria are familiar. The ability to carry the load for the prescribed time, preventing the passage of flame and hot gases to the opposite side of the assembly, and to limit the temperature transmission uh, to not more than 250 degrees ambient above amb um, 250 degrees average above ambient are familiar criteria you, you've seen before in the other tests. So with those criteria, the uh, photo on the left, is that a pass or a fail? Well, that did not limit the passage of flame through the assembly. That is a fail. The photo on the right is a, a photo of that same beam on, an, on the earlier slide. Uh, there's some deflection in that beam after the fire exposure, but it did not collapse and is considered acceptable. So getting into some of the work within our firm, many WSGENI ELSER project managers involve uh, work, uh, the work involves restoration of a building to pre-damaged condition. In some cases, our work involves an addition or an alteration where the requirements are based upon a building code as if for new construction. The latter case is usually less complicated because the required rating is specified by the, by the applicable building code. Establishing the required rating for the former case may be more complicated. It may also involve determination of what the rating of the existing condition is, where there are no as-built drawings or where field construction elements are not apparent and we'll identify some techniques shortly. So determining what is needed. In renovating, repairing, or building new construction, we must first learn what is required. That can be determined from the design documents for existing construction, or it may be identified through the type of construction which it would be indicated on a building certificate of occupancy, if it can be located, or through an independent code analysis. This is fundamental to establishing the basis of design or the basis of the analysis, depending upon our scope of work. So determining what do we have. It's important to determine what we have so it can be compared with what is needed. What we have can be determined by a drawing review, verified by a field investigation, non-destructive testing such as ground penetrating radar or other methods, a sampling of the building components by creating openings in the construction and removal of samples, followed by a laboratory analysis. We're uniquely qualified to do this work in-house. The staff of the JTC has been utilized to help determine materials, thicknesses, and fire resistance ratings for several projects. 
Nick will have that included in one of the case studies. <clears throat> there are a number of references also to help with establishing the rating of construction, both what we have and what is required to meet the required ratings. A long time reference is the UL Fire Resistance Directory. Many firms have extensive libraries of these books, which include designs for walls, floors, roofs of various construction materials, which have all been tested in the furnaces of UL to the E119 fire exposure curve. But like with other things, time marches on. This is considered, the books are today considered old technology, and this information is now available online. The online search allows the user to narrow down the selection of approved products and designs. In this case, fire resistance rated systems, highlighted in that box, was selected and brought up on the screen, which allows for a more specific search from almost 2,000 designs. In this case, clicking through to fire resistance ratings, then the online search, it allows the user to narrow down the selection of approved designs for walls, to walls for example, of combustible construction for a given rating. Here's an example of an existing approved design published by UL in the online directory. This design is known as BXUV7, involving a floor ceiling assembly. And don't worry, we'll drill down here uh, to get a better view of these uh, individual pages. You can see it has various ratings for restrained and unrestrained conditions, and it shows a detail of the design and the identification of the elements which constitute the approved assembly. The elements are keyed by number to a narrative description of the product, the product manufacturer when applicable, the thickness, the installation method, etc. as shown here. Now the narrative can be very specific, in, more specific than this in many cases. But you've got to remember the UL tests are and other tests at other agencies have been paid for by the manufacturers of the products used in the test. And having a tested and listed product is considered a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Manufacturers whose products are not included in these designs are technically not approved because the performance of those products has not been established. And keep in mind that in order to qualify as approved, the field condition or the design must be identical to the products in the listing. Otherwise, the claim is it's not been tested, so we can't say what the resulting performance will be. There are some obvious exceptions to that, such as a thicker layer of concrete than what's in the specified design, but changing one manufacturer's product for another is an example of an unknown condition. And we'll discuss how to deal with that when we talk about engineering judgments in just a few minutes. Here's some, here's some uh, information about the UL websites. Uh, we will also be posting these on the WJE portal for the fire protection TRG shortly. So don't worry about copying this down. Another good literature source to select an assembly that meets the required fire resistance rating uh, are building codes. The document on the left is a 1976 edition of the Standard Building Code, which as uh, many of you know has been superseded by the IBC. The reason I'm citing that code and that edition is that it has an extensive appendix with listings of all types of assemblies, which is very useful. And that helpful appendix was deleted in the editions following the 1976. On the right is an excerpt from the current edition of the IBC, the 2015 edition. Chapter 7 of the IBC includes a list of assemblies and ratings which may be able to be matched to the assembly in question. A couple more publications. A publication from, the, uh, from U.S. Gypsum is on the left and from the Gypsum Association is on the right. Each has descriptions of design assemblies which have been tested or otherwise qualified as, as providing the published fire ratings. And these 
publications are typically considered credible by the local authorities. A couple of other uh, handy references of some industry publications. The, the book on the left uh, gives a real good introduction to fire exposure uh, and the response of structures to fires, which outline uh, important contribution of structural fire resistance to overall fire safety. Uh, it describes methods of calculating the severity and fire resistance for structural steel, reinforced concrete, and even timber construction. On the right, the design for fire resistance of precast, pre-stressed concrete uh, is a good source. The publisher is the Precast Pre-Stressed Concrete Institute, um, and it has designs which, according to ICC, are considered as an alternative method to what's specified in the IBC. And I believe our Matt Carlton contributed to this publication. I have found this publication, Guideline on Fire Ratings of Archaic Materials and Assemblies by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, especially helpful in dealing with old buildings where materials and assemblies do not appear in the typical publications. This publication is available in the WIS Jenny Library. As an example, looking at the page on the right, uh, it shows fire ratings for cast iron columns, and I've actually used this information on several projects. But what if, what if, despite all of your efforts of looking for traditional solutions, you're not able to find a published design which represents your condition? Here are some ideas. Alternatives to the published designs include performing a code review and developing alternate methods, uh, conducting an engineering judgment report, which is intended to develop an equivalency to the strict requirements of, of a code, or doing fire tests. Uh, drilling down here, sometimes the current edition of the code might allow a lesser requirement based on conditions which would be applicable to your project such as the presence of automatic sprinklers or alternatives that were not available at the time the building was originally designed. Another purpose of a code review is to verify that the requirement is being properly applied. In some cases, uh, the requirement was incorrectly applied by the architect and even the code official. Maybe, also, there's an alternative to strict compliance of the code. Chapter 1 of the IBC allows alternate materials and methods to achieve the same objective as the prescriptive language of the code. If you're stuck, this can be a possible solution, although it will require the approval of the local authorities. As mentioned earlier, if the field condition or design does not allow compliance with a tested or published design, the use of an engineering judgment is another avenue. This requires the analysis of the proposed materials and comparison of the proposed design to other similar designs which have been tested. This is applicable, for example, to the case where a specific brand of a material has been substituted with the product from another manufacturer. Another example includes changing the thickness of a material in a previously tested design. This approach requires knowledge of material behavior and fire test procedures. The local jurisdictions will likely require the licensed professional to stamp the submittal. But even with all the I's dotted and T's crossed, there's no assurance that the proposal will be approved by the local jurisdiction. This option is generally the last resort, performing fire tests. It's the last resort because of the time and cost involved. WJE is currently involved in arranging a test for an assembly which differs from the published tests and where the local authority is looking for a test or a report from a nationally recognized fire testing laboratory. It's important to involve the local authorities in the planning of a test, if it's going to be performed, to make sure it will be approved if successful. Once again, however, there's no assurance of the outcome or if the local authorities will approve the result. So this is something to avoid, of course, in the interest of the client's budget and schedule, if possible. Now we're going to get into a number of case studies, and I'm going to turn this over to Nick Ozog. 
Thank you, Carl. I will attempt to tie in much of the information Carl discussed with some actual project examples we have done at WJE regarding fire resistance ratings. Uh, the first example is a case study regarding the old post office in Chicago, Illinois. This case study showcases Carl's previous point on conducting a code review and the possibility of finding building code support for a fire resistance related issue. Built in two sections, the old post office was completed in 1933 and has been vacant for the last 20 years. The building is a historic structure that is planned to be repurposed. As you can see with the arrow, commuter rail passes underneath the post office at what is called the track level, essentially the basement. WJE is working on many facets of the repurposing and renovation of this project. However, for the purpose of this discussion, regarding, we will focus on fire resistance, and specifically the track level repairs and what is being called a compressor building that is lo also located at the track level. The, this figure shows the five colored areas uh, around the building that were the focus of the investigation. The key to this project is that all the areas investigated were outside the building envelope, indicated in the gray area identified as number six. The colored areas primarily relate to loading docks, sidewalks, driveways, and what will become a plaza. To further identify the locations that were investigated, the photos on the right show the loading docks and sidewalks in future plaza areas. The areas circled are air vents from the track level below. Furthermore, the, the colored areas outside the building footprint are approximately 140,000 square feet in area where the building footprint in gray is approximately 220,000 square feet. Moving towards the, the track level and some of the existing conditions, ideally the steel beams and columns are encased in concrete and support the slab above that was shown in those previous pictures. However, the existing conditions show widespread spalling of the concrete in areas outside the building footprint. And these are just a few of the areas um, investigated. Some additional areas showing the spalling concrete and exposed structural steel with corrosion are shown here, where the concrete encasement to function as fireproofing uh, has failed. When WJE reviewed the extent of the concrete spalling and the damage to the fireproofing, alternative options were sought. It is with thanks that Peter Tarara got us involved to try to help. We were able to work with Peter and the other WJE uh, individuals to create two viable options. Option one was to repair the spalled concrete encasement and essentially the fireproofing. Option two was to conduct a building code review and determine if areas outside the building envelope required structural fireproofing. Option one was to repair the, the fireproofing or encasement. When evaluating the extent of the fireproofing and the, the level of effort needed to um, re-encase the structural steel, repair contractors estimated it would cost millions of dollars. And these dollars, furthermore, the client thought that these dollars were being spent outside the building envelope, which we were. So not pretty dollars. Option two was to conduct a code review. This option became more viable after everyone saw the, the cost of repairing the concrete encasement. The focus of the building code review was on the required structural fire resistance ratings for areas outside of the building envelope. However, to strengthen the potential discussion with the city, the requirements for structural fire ratings were also evaluated as if the structural elements were supporting a building. The Chicago Building Code is unique in some ways, and to paraphrase two sections of the CBC, if the construction is more than 20 feet above the walking surface, fireproofing is not required on those structural elements. Additionally, fireproofing is not required on structural elements when they are exterior or outside of the building envelope, such as what we have with the old post office. 
Using those reference building code sections, a logical discussion for presenting to the city was prepared. The key points for this discussion are the areas being discussed do not support the building, the old post office structure. The areas do not house emergency generators or switchgear that are related to the old post office building. Additionally, the concept of having unprotected structure with driveways, loading docks, and parking below has been done before in Chicago, so there was precedent. Although not solely relied upon for justification, precedent can be a useful point when working with the city or jurisdiction. The Chicago Tr Department of Transportation also prefers to have steel exposed on bridges for inspection. They want to be able to see the condition of the structural steel, and if or when encased in fireproofing, one cannot in inspect the structural integrity of the steel. As some of the previously shown existing conditions indicate there was some corrosion of, on the steel. The final step was presenting the code discussion to the design team and eventually the city. The design team agreed that we should present the case for not providing fireproofing in the areas outside the building envelope. As a result, we attended a meeting with the city and the design team and presented our option. The background was provided and the key points previously discussed were mentioned. In the end, the city agreed that primarily because the areas were outside the building envelope and not supporting building structure, fireproofing would not be required. The Chicago Department of Transportation position on steel inspections was also helpful in this case. The end result was that the design team and project owner were happy because millions of dollars estimated are able to be saved. Case study two relates to an investigation of a floor slab fire resistance rating in an existing building. This case study shows an example of an engineering judgment analysis that may be prepared to identify structural fire resistance ratings. For background, this building is a hospital wing in Chicago, built about 10 years ago. But when that was built, not all the floors were fitted out and several were left as shelf spaces. With the intent as needed, the shelf space floors would be built out. However, the contractor building out the shelf space floors um, recently began to question the existing construction, specifically the thickness of the floor slab and the ne necessity to provide spray applied fire resistant material or SFRM to the underside of the floor slab in select locations. As a result, WJ was contacted and, in, and an investigation began. This, this slide should identify the floor plan. The areas in red um, show the specific areas the contractor wanted investigated due to depressed floor slabs in these areas. Adding complexity to the project was that during the building, the build out, few different occupancies were planned for the finished cell space. As a result, the Chicago Building Code required a three hour fire rated floor slab or floor ceiling assembly. This is somewhat unique as in most areas of the country, floor slabs generally have or are required to be a two hour fire resistance rating. Furthermore, the floor to ceiling heights were large, over 15 feet, making accessing the underside of the slabs a challenge. Additionally, the shelf spaces were being constructed extremely quickly and access to the underside of the floor slab was being limited almost by the day. These two images show the existing conditions that are simplified into two main conditions, areas with the composite metal decking and an area without a metal deck. The area without the metal deck was an extra thick slab to support the MRIs above. The arrow shows the SFRM on the beam that was outside the evaluation of the scope of this project. This was an excellent project in that it got to incorporate the JTC in many aspects and service offerings of WJE. On the left is a picture of the ground penetrating radar GPR used by JTC to better understand the field conditions or thicknesses of the floor slabs. The picture on the right is a core sample obtained during the site investigation that JTC was able to use to conduct a petrographic analysis to determine the type of concrete used in the floor slab. The type of concrete was important when evaluating the fire resistance rating as different types of concrete have different fire resistant ratings. After gathering the information in the field and working with JPC, 
an analysis of the floor slab needed to be conducted to determine a fire resistance rating. As Carl discussed earlier, the fire resistance rating of a floor slab is dependent on both its ability to resist heat transmission and its ability to remain structurally sound for the given period of time. In this particular case, three hours when exposed to a t standard time temperature curve of ASTM E119. However, instead of conducting a costly test, we were able to calculate the fire resistance ratings of the assemblies using standard published documents, including specifically for this case, the American Concrete Institute's standard 216.1. Tom Rowe was extremely helpful in working through these calculations, especially the structural fire resistance ratings portion. And after JTC determined the concrete type and provided the GPR data to determine the existing slab thickness, an equivalent thickness was determined for the slab. In summary, the equivalent thickness allows for the incorporation of the thickness of the slab when the depth of the flute is also included. The orange arrow shows the minimum thickness of the slab, and a yellow arrow shows the equivalent thickness. The calculation methods of the, of the ACI standard were used for this determination. After using the ACI methodology, the fire resistance ratings of the slab were determined. In summary, for the MRI, or the area with no metal deck, both the heat transmission and structural fire resistance ratings were calculated to be minimally three hours. Therefore, no additional work was necessary. However, the toilet and shower rooms, or the areas where the metal deck was located, were calculated to pr not provide the minimum necessi necessary three-hour fire resistance ratings. Therefore, additional uh, spray-applied fireproofing was needed on the underside of the deck. In conclusion, WJE issued a fire resistance rating analysis report documenting the work, including the JTC efforts. In the end, the contractor was able to save some time and some money. Unfortunately, some areas still required fireproofing. Therefore, the savings were not as significant as in the previous case study. This case study shows that it is not guaranteed that the information or calculations used to determine fire resistance ratings will be favorable for all cases and for all clients. Finally, case study three is interesting because it involved, again, several different aspects of WJE. Additionally, a field in investigation was conducted, including destructive testing, sample gathering for investigation by the JTC in the laboratory, a literature review, and detailed calculations to, to determine the fire resistance rating of the wall. We were able to help out the New York office, along with significant help from the JTC to determine the fire resistance rating of that exterior wall. For some background, the building owner wanted to add an addition, but because the existing building did not have fire sprinklers and the new addition was going to have an atrium, and that the building code required that the existing exterior wall shown in the previous picture needed to have a two-hour fire resistance rating. The project uh, to determine the fire resistance rating began with a field investigation, where a contractor cut a hole in the wall to observe the existing construction. As shown in the figure, three main components of the wall are shown, including the CMU block, the fiber insulation, and plaster on metal lath. Additionally, during the field investigation, samples were gathered for return to the JTC and additional laboratory analysis. This slide shows the various components of the asymmetric wall. The calculation methods used in this analysis and described in more detail um, break the assembly into various individual components, and an additive process documented in ACI is used to determine the fire resistance rating for the entire wall. Because the wall is not uniform or symmetric, the calculations to determine fire resistance rating were needed to be conducted twice. The fire calculation discussed next is a fire originating on the exterior side, the side shown in the first um, picture with, uh, with the fire next to it. For the purpose of this exposure, the metal panel and air gap between the fire and CMU block was ignored and not credited with increasing the fire resistance rating of the assembly as a whole. The metal panel will effectively conduct the heat of the fire through the airspace 
and that airspace will heat up quickly. Therefore, the metal panel was ignored and the CMU was considered first. The ACEI standard 216.1 was used to evaluate the CMU block. Similar to the floor slab analysis in case study two, an equivalent thickness of the CMU block was determined using the ACI standard. The total thickness could not be used because the void spaces have implications for the fire resistance rating. Furthermore, a petrographic analysis was done to determine the type of aggregate in the block because that also has an effect on the fire resistance rating of the block. Using the equivalent thickness of the block and the type of aggregate determined by JTC, the, AC, the following ACI table is used. Because the block thicknesses is between two different fire ratings, interpolation can be done to determine the fire resistant rating of the individual component. It was determined that the block alone through interpolation cannot provide a two hour fire resistant rating. Therefore, next the plaster element on the non-fire exposed side was investigated. The JTC laboratory analysis indicated that the plaster was comprised of three layers. The finished coat was primarily gypsum based and the two base coats were primarily Portland based the Portland cement based. This was important to determine because the fire resistance ratings of the type of plaster um, have different fire ratings. Again, from the ACI table, interpolation was used to determine the plastic or the plaster multiplying factor for the finished uh, for the finish on the non-fire exposed side of the masonry wall. This was necessary to determine an equivalent thickness of the plaster plus the, the CMU block. Using interpolation from the previously provided ACI table, the plaster multiplying factor was determined for the specific field installed plaster. The total equivalent thickness of the assembly, the CMU and the plaster, could then be determined using the ACI formulas and previously shown tables. It was determined that minimally the assembly has a, a two hour fire resistance rating from a fire on the exterior side. Because the assembly is asymmetric, the assembly was also evaluated for a fire on the interior or opposite side of the wall. This time the plaster on the left is directly exposed to fire and different materials behave differently or have different fire ratings depending on if the material is on the fire exposed side or non-exposed side of an assembly. Using a similar process outlined previously and documented in ACI, the assembly from an interior fire exposure on the wall obtained a minimum calculated fire resistance rating of slightly more than two hours. The result was an engineering judgment and documented letter with the associated calculations showing that the existing wall assembly provides a minimum of a two hour fire rating when exposed to a fire on either side. WJE got to show a client how multiple offices and service offerings including the JC, JTC could work together to solve a building issue involving fire resistance ratings. As a result, the client and contractor was able to save time and money because the additional work to bring up the existing wall to code required two hour fire resistance rating was not necessary. It should be noted that the windows in the wall were planned to be replaced with a two hour fire rated construction. And now in summary I'll turn it back to Carl. Thanks Nick. Uh, brief to summarize uh, of this presentation. Fire resistance ratings are relative to a standard test. They are not necessarily representative of actual field endurance or the time on a clock in a real fire. Various sources of published uh, fire tests of wall, floor, and roof assemblies exist and allow us to match the actual case to the published results. Alternatives to these published tests include code analysis, alternate methods, engineering judgments, and fire tests. So we're here to assist you with questions on this topic in the future or to help you with your projects and give one of us a call. We're also considering preparing another webinar on applying fire resistance ratings which establish the types of construction and relate them to the allowable heights and areas of the code 
Please drop us a note or respond to the survey if you would be interested in such a part two on this topic. We also want to thank uh, Tom Rowe of the JTC, Liz Mullen of Fire Protection, Peter Terrera of Chicago, Doug Stevie of New York, and the other was Jenny Elsner. Project managers have used us in projects involving ratings. And now we're able to take your questions. All right. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Nick. Um, so let's see. To get us started, um, the first question here says, why are automatic sprinklers not recognized in these tests or ratings? Um, the, the typical fire resistance rating history is that the protection is known as passive protection. It does not include active systems. Uh, this is part of the building strategy that does not rely upon anything working other than just passive materials like like uh, concrete, steel, and uh, uh, providing protection for people through barriers. Uh, sprinkler systems may fail, and the premise is that the, the base protection needs to be provided through passive means. All right. Um, the next question here says, are exterior walls always required to have equivalent rating from both sides? It depends on the rating. Um, if the it depends if the if the exterior wall is close to the property line or has a rating, I believe more than one hour, uh, then it needs to have. Let me back up. If exterior walls are normally rated from a fire from the inside out. But if it's in proximity to a property line or the rating is more than an hour, it needs to have a rating in each direction. Okay. The next question here says, what do the designations like BXUV7 in the UL Directory of Tested Assemblies mean? That's simply a UL uh, terminology. That's how they they have various classifications of their listings of products, and it's just an alphanumeric. The BXUV is a alpha classification for that rated wall, and seven is simply the numeric number for that uh, assembly that is in that category. All right. I don't see any more questions. Carl and Nick, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap things up? No, again, I think we're, we're looking to see if this topic uh, is of interest, uh, a part two. Uh, we'd be happy to do that. All right, great. Well, thanks again, Nick and Carl, and thank you to everyone who was able to join us. Have a great afternoon, everybody.